going to start an um, SML project uh, as part of our bite size workforce bite size summer program. And um, the session is being recorded today. Um, so if there's any problems with me putting it up onto YouTube, please let me know. It will be a private account, so only people with the link can see it. Um, I'm just going to quickly talk you through housekeeping. Uh, if you could just keep your mic on mute to avoid any feedback, uh, we do encourage you to keep your camera turned on, but recognise you might need a break from the camera. Sign. Please raise your hand if you want to contribute. <clears throat> we will be doing questions at the end, so you can use the chat function in the meantime. And just to note that I won't be recording the questions either. That will be a safe space to ask anything you're comfortable with. <laughs> Um, like I said, the session is being recorded and I will send out a follow up email with um, the slides and any other information Louise would like me to share as well as the recording. Um, so I'm now going to pass on, pass over rather to Louise. Oh. You're on mute Louise. Right, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I'm Louise. I'm one of the uh, Band 7 physios here at Salford Royal. Um, unfortunately, this time I haven't got Mel with me. Mel's my technical expert, so <laughs> this could, could work. I'm going to try and, and share my screen now. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Fine. So yeah, we were asked to um, feedback. Uh, so this the yeah the project that we completed in April. Um, like I say, it was it was me and Mel who um, completed the project, and um, she's one of our uh, principal psychologists here at Salford. But yeah, unfortunately, she can't be with us today. So the aim of the project um, was a delivery of a six week program to patients um, on an orthopedic waiting list for joint replacement surgery. So that could be either a hip, total hip replacement or a total knee replacement. Um, and we designed a prehabilitation class consisting of advice and education um, followed by an exercise based circuit class uh, with the aim of optimizing mental and physical wellness whilst people were waiting for surgery. So back in July uh, last year, we did a pilot study of 20 patients um, and we got some really good results and we fed that back and then carried on with the uh, programme. So the main reason for um, doing this was that obviously it was um, during COVID-19 and the waiting lists for surgery or for any type of appointment were um, very long. So people that had been listed for surgery or waiting to be listed for surgery had very poor communication whilst they're waiting. There were no face to face appointments with um, GPs or with surgeons or with physio. Um, it was causing kind of quite a lot of stress and increased visits to GP for pain um, pain management. Um, when people did actually get a surgical date and um, they had very poor levels of fitness and poor um, obviously, which would impact on their operation. Um, and they also had very uh, bad anxiety and depression as they could have been waiting without any communication for two years. So the second reason um, what that would lead to is, like we said, poorer surgical outcomes because of lack of um, mobility during this time. Um, fitness levels are really low. That would kind of have a consequence on uh, hospital stays and increase the length of hospital stays. Um, and then possible post-op complications due to lack of good preparation for surgery. So the funding came from the CCG. Um, so we had a senior manager who set up the, the process and oversaw the project and Band 7 Physio myself um, to set up and deliver the service. We had a therapy assistant part time uh, who mostly um, recruited the patients and then the principal psychologist two hours a week of her time to feed into the program and um, provide the psychology input. So we did this alongside um, Active Lifestyles. So Active Lifestyles is a Salford Community Leisure um, service and they have coaches 
that deliver uh, on many um, kind of programs, including uh, cardiac rehab, uh, pulmonary rehab. So we decided to use their service as well, um, as they were really good at engaging people um, and getting them to then continue to exercise. So they also offer a 12 week free pass for patients. So once they've finished our six week program, they could then continue to exercise for free uh, in the community leisure centres, in any of the community leisure centres in Salford um, for 12 weeks. Obviously, that was for Salford uh, patients. Um, and doing this in the community leisure facilities meant rather than in the hospital meant that the patient was then more familiar with going to a gym. So a lot of the patients that are on these kind of waiting lists uh, having joint replacement surgery have probably never stepped foot inside a gym before. So the anxiety that goes with that um, and the lack of confidence would really then affect their ability to carry on with this um, after our programme. So that's why we decided to do that in the community facilities. So what did we do? We invited um, all the patients on an orthopaedic waiting list, and that, like I said, was for a total hip or a total knee, um, to attend a six-week programme. We delivered the six-week prehabilitation programme. We did education covering um, the procedure, the nature of the procedure, importance of activity, improving mood and confidence. Uh, we discussed things like sleep, pacing and relaxation. Uh, and then at the end of that, there was an exercise component, which was um, led by the Active Lifestyle Coaches. So we took outcome measures, completed that pre and post programme, um, and the outcome measures consisted of both psychological and physical um, measures. And we fed back quarterly to the CCG um, with an ongoing review of the service. So the impact that we hope we would have is an improvement in the outcome measures, which is what we're feeding back. Um, the programme delivery meets the needs of patients awaiting joint replacement surgery. Um, we hope that they would be better equipped to cope whilst waiting for surgery. And um, we thought it was a prehabilitation model that can be rolled out to other surgical areas, so not just specific to orthopaedic surgery. And what we would then envisage is better surgical outcomes, although it wasn't measured as part of this uh, project. But the other side of my role within the hospital is I work in orthopaedic clinics and I do all the post-op clinics for um, orthopaedic surgery. So I see all these patients. So the patients that came through the programme, I followed up anyway, um, but like I say, not as part of this project. So what did we want to know? Did the outcome measures uh, improve post-programme? Um, and we also did some qualitative interviews. So we could then um, establish whether there was any impact of intervention on GP visits. Did patients continue with the exercise on discharge or did they just do the six weeks and then um, nothing else? Did the patients benefit from referral to other services? So as part of the um, Sulfur Community Leisure kind of um, and the Active Lifestyles uh, service, there is access to smoking cessation, more life for weight loss um, and obviously the Active Lifestyles free pass, as I've already mentioned. So the total numbers contacted between July um, and February this year were 192. Total number that we recruited, so those that agreed, were 102. So out of those that agreed, those that attended uh, week one was 73, so 72%. Um, the total number that completed all the sessions was 39. And the data that we have for to present back really is on is on that complete data. So just those 39 patients that completed all sessions that we've got completed data for. We also noted differences in the pre-scores between the completers and the dropouts. So maybe to explain why um, there was quite a high uh, dropout rate, really. And I suppose the numbers are kind of disappointing but not surprising for this kind of cohort. So results wise we got very good results in all everything we measured so one of the um, questionnaires was the MSKHQ which we use here in physio for, for everybody um, that comes through. So we did pre and post scores and the highest score is indicative of better function so following the um, six week 
uh, course, they, it was a significant um, difference in their scores for better function. We used a pain catastrophizing scale. So again, this came part from um, Mel, who works with the pain team. This is what they use um, with their patients. So a lower score indicates uh, less pain related distress. So as you can see, following the group, um, the score did drop significantly. So people had uh, were scoring much, much better on that questionnaire. And the other one that came from the pain team was pain self-efficacy scale. So higher cause, higher scores, sorry, indicate better coping. So again, significantly better following the uh, six sessions. Functionally, we used a 10 meter walk. So we did a time 10 meter walk pre and post. So the lower um, the time, obviously the better indication of function. And again, that was significantly uh, better. And the other functional score we used was the sit to stand. So it's a, a measure of strength, really. So the higher scores in, indicate uh, increased strength, again, significantly better post uh, programme. So we also looked because it was we wondered why um, kind of the dropout might be might be quite so high. So we looked at the pre intervention scores between those that completed uh, the course and those that dropped out. And um, significantly, the, the completers were doing much better um, at their baseline. So the people that dropped out were obviously struggling more with um, the, the kind of pain and the coping of the pain uh, because their function, as you can see there, was not significantly different. So it was more about um, the psychology aspect um, that the completers were obviously much better or significantly better at baseline. So that was just quite interesting, really. Um, so we looked at satisfaction data and qualitative feedback. Um, so we did a satisfaction questionnaire. So was it helpful to be part of a group? I, you know, I think these are all self-explanatory as um, 25 found it extremely helpful. Um, did the information in the sessions meet your needs? So the majority uh, said extremely well. Did you find the staff at the pain centre um, and in our programme, I suppose, is uh, friendly and easy to talk to? So yeah, I suppose that's uh, very friendly and easy to talk to. Uh, how likely are to re can re recommend this to family and friends? So extremely likely in the majority. Um, and then we gave some um, uh, feedback forms so that they could could write their comments. So most people um, found the sessions very helpful and enjoyed the sessions. Good sessions, helpful, encouraging, um, very informative, supportive. A lot of people found the pain was um, worse at first, but if they carried on with the, the sessions, obviously it became much more manageable. Um, yeah, so just some interesting comments there, really. Um, so the next question, kind of on the satisfaction feedback form. Um, again, the, those are the basic kind of um, things that came out of that. So it was good to be in a group situation. Everyone's friendly and easy to talk to. Sessions were helpful. Um, yeah, staff friendly and approachable. Extremely good preparation for surgery. Good class, not pushy. Exercise suitable for all levels, basically. Um, all staff friendly and welcoming. And then we did some interviews. So with eight participants, we um, did some phone interviews afterwards with them. Um, and these are the key themes really of to what they said. So they found the diaphragmatic breathing, the relaxation part was really useful, found it helpful to be part of a group. And um, seven participants um, of the eight said that they didn't uh, go to the GP anymore. Um, so yeah, in reinforce the importance of exercise, a helpful way to get into exercise if you haven't got a clue uh, where to start. Uh, improved confidence to exercise, more aware of exercises for their specific joint. Um, they started to do more exercises before it is painful, but they didn't expect that the pain was going to go away with this, but it made it more manageable. Improved knowledge and coping, so putting both psychology and physio together, it gives you a better uh, insight into what's going to happen. Uh, every session was built on the last. It's helpful um, to put it into words they could understand. Made them, their worrying about the pain was much, much better. 
um, and improve motivation to be active. So if you stick to it, it helps to motivate and um, it gets you up and out and rather than kind of staying in at home. Um, yeah, and good social benefits of attending a group. Nice to know you're not the only one. Um, yeah, reinforce that you're not the only person going through this, knowing that you're not alone. Um, Salford has great facilities. Um, so our thoughts, basically, recruitment is really, really difficult. So like I said, the numbers are disappointing, but not surprising for this cohort. They're on a waiting list for surgery. They think they need surgery. Um, so you've got a lot of negative, negative phone conversations trying to recruit people, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration. Um, why would they benefit from physio when they needed an operation? So trying to change people's mindsets was really, really difficult. Trying to get people to engage was really difficult. Um, so 38% of those identified as eligible and contacted attended week one. So if rolling out into the community, more resources would be needed to recruit people into the intervention. Attrition is high, uh, only 53% completed. That's 20% of the total eligible sample. Those who dropped out, as we said, scored significantly lower um, on daily function and pain coping at baseline. So they're also higher on pain distress, but it's not, that wasn't st statistically significant. So therefore, are more resources needed for this cohort as they are more distressed given that their physical function scores were similar. So the psychological aspect of it, and we, we knew that really from the telephone conversations we had with people like say when we we're trying to recruit. But for those that do complete, the outcomes are good. Um, stati statistically significant change on all psychological and physical function measures, high levels of self-related satisfaction, and the qualitative feedback highlighting themes of confidence with physical activity, improved motivation, social benefits of attending, and better coping with the current situation. Okay, I will stop sharing. Fine, so yeah, any questions? Since you've posted those results to people, have you found um, when you're inviting new people that the take up is better? Sorry, I'm struggling to hear you there. Let me just turn my speakers up. Oh, sorry. sorry can can you you repeat? Say that again? Yeah. Yep. Um, it was um, when you are recruiting people now that those figures have come out, if you're sharing them with um, people, are they more inclined to um, to join the training sessions you're offering or the, the exercise sessions you're offering? So it's, it's finished now. Oh, so you didn't carry it on after that? No, no, no. Okay. It finished in right, April. Yeah, that was that okay. was all we had. That was the numbers that we had for that. It was only a 12 month project um, which was funded and finished in April. So we haven't carried on with it now. OK, right. Thank you very much. OK. Am I able to just jump in? Yeah, um, Rachel. Yes. I was say that I <laughs> um, you've kind of just answered that. I was going to ask sort of what are the next steps then? So you've done the pilot, learnt this. Is there yeah. a plan to roll this out or are you seeking additional funding? What What's next? Yeah, I, I don't know. Sati on here. Sati boys, no. She is, yep. yes. She yes. just put yeah. something in the chat. I just yeah. put in the chat. Do you want Sati me to can help me out with this? this next. This so, um, the just to go back a step. So, in terms of kind of the origins of it, it was around um, as um, Louise was saying when COVID was at its height, and there was a, a system board at primary care level that identified these people that were waiting without. Um, in pain and without any any with just a long waiting list ahead of them and primary care cell actually said does anyone have any solutions to this and this is where um louise's project came in so we took it was only a couple of weeks ago wasn't it louise we went back to primary care system board so this is senior people in primary care people like rob bellingham manisha kumar um some of some of the other people that work at that senior system level and they um, were incredibly positive about this piece of work. So they, they came up with a, a number of actions and recommendations for us. The first one was that um, 
they were going to put us in touch with somebody from their BI performance team. So what they want us to do is to look at that data set of the 39 people who went through the programme and improved. And they want us to track forward with the help of the performance team as to whether there is any difference in length of stay when these people have gone into the acute setting, just to almost bolster up some of the, the outcome data we've got. So we're waiting for Ed Dyson to, to get in touch with us. Um, the next thing that they were going to do was there is a GM elective reform programme. So they are going to be plugging this piece of work into that. And I believe, Louise, I haven't had a chance to catch up with you, but I've, I've heard some rumblings that that has already started to happen. Okay. The third thing that they were going to do is there's a GM clinical effectiveness committee group that looks at how we spread good practice and scale it up. So they, the, the group that we went to very much thought that we, we didn't need to do any more proving of whether this was a good idea. There's an evidence base, a strong evidence base for prehabilitation and that actually it, it works well and we actually just need to, to start doing it. So again, Manisha Kumar, who's the medical director for primary care in NHS GM, is linking us into, um, into that keg. And the idea is, is that we look at what, what would we need to do to scale up the work that Louise and Mel have done a, a, across GM, because it would fit with all sorts of other, um, it's not just hips and knees, is it? Uh, I know Louise, you said in the past, there's, there's other um, groups of patients that this approach would would um would fit with so i don't know if that helps if you're tired yeah. with louise so all right rachel yeah just just to let you know so i work in the gm elective care program and i know myself and a couple of colleagues are on today from that program because we saw this come out and thought oh we fantastic we want to know what happened with this and um, so we look forward to picking that up with you um so i i support the program with comms and engagement and i look after our while you wait offer so it'd be really good to kind of pick that up and explore links um as you put in touch with us yeah or uh, i don't know whether it's worth louise just making the links with rachel yeah um yeah if you cool. yeah if you could send me an email rachel with um, sure. your details that'd be perfect yeah wonderful thank you has anyone else got any questions that they want to ask oh erica yeah Oh, you're on mute, Erica. I just wondered um, whether the participants had any help getting from home to the exercise and back home again. Was there any assistance there? How did they how did they make that journey? No, they didn't. So, oh, some feedback on that. Is that um, the majority were from Salford. So if they were out of area, that was a little bit of an issue, so they didn't really want to travel, although we did have people that came from Bolton. Um, but generally, the people that lived in Salford, they drove or they got the bus. Um, but we didn't really get too many complaints about the travel. And I think because it was in the community facilities, it's much easier to park. If they're coming to the hospital, the complaints that we have about parking and um, access are, are, you know, Fair all the time, but because there's parking on site, easy access, it was much better. Oh, you unmute us again. Do you think people who have got these hip problems might find, you know, catching a box a bit of a challenge? Would it be possible for future things to, you know, to help them in some way? And as you say, it's, it's difficult to park at hospitals. This might have played a part in people dropping out. Yeah, okay. um, I suppose, yeah, the, like I said, the majority did drive, so um, they didn't have an issue. But I suppose for yeah, access and inequalities, then people that were relying on public transport may not have wanted to come. And we did get that when we when we were phoning people to invite them. We did get uh, quite a few comments on that they wouldn't be able to get there and they'd have to rely on other people to take them. So, yeah, so transport is an issue. Um, but I know there is um, there is other kind of programmes in the community that do have you can do that from home. So you can log on. We didn't have any of that. We didn't use that. But that, again, is another 
possibility, another avenue to explore as to whether people can do this from home and whether they'd have the same motivation to do that from home. On um, doing it online, of course, older people are have the reputation of uh, not a, not one hundred percent of them going online. Mm. So that, that's another inequality really that, that needs to be looked at. Yes, the majority of them are elderly, um, and would yeah would probably yeah I mean you don't you can't make that assumption can you? But yeah maybe some of them wouldn't have had access. Rachel, do you want to come back in? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, it's just Erica's question prompted another thought from me. Um, did you collect any equality, equality monitoring information from participants? So do we understand it from like a broader protected characteristic point of view? You know, was it was it mainly sort of white English people taking part or do we do we understand sort of the demographics of, of who were able to take part? Yeah, we didn't include that in uh, we didn't collect any information on that really it probably was majority we didn't we didn't have um you know if they would have needed a translator we didn't have that kind of access to translators in the class or anything like that so that would have probably been one of the the barriers to, to come in if they didn't speak english thank you Uh, Sati, here. Yeah, so yeah. just picking up on those points, I think it's important just to 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 make it clear it was just a really small pilot dipping your toe in the water, and I was hoping that um, certainly I'm pleased, Rachel, that you're on the call because some of these things around equality, inclusion, making sure we target the right people and put the right support in, like transport. Um, I was hoping there were some of the things that are a wider scale up might be able to help with um so it's not kind of a it's not that it's a limitation of what we've done because it it, it did what it was set to do out on the tin and what what the bid was about um it's a great piece of work the other thing that manisha sent us was some information on respect to health yeah, um so i didn't know rachel whether you'd heard of that respect to no. health and okay so i can send you the stuff that she sent me i'll try and get you your I'll put it in the. Address. I'll put my email in the chat. Yeah. And... I'll send you the respect to health stuff as well. But I think it's what you were saying, Erica. You've got to recognise, haven't you, that not everybody's kind of um, digital access or competency is at a level um, where they can engage. Um, and I think it's some of those kind of inclusivity aspects that you could really look at in the scale up to to make it happen. So well, I really hope, um, having been, you know part of watching Louise and, and Mel do this piece of work. I really hope we can scale it up because it it's really, really good practice, good yeah. results that you've achieved. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say it, it's a, it's an exercise which has got enormous potential. I can, I can see that. Um, and uh, the, the psychology of feeling that there'd be um, prepared for the operation and so on m m will be very good, I'm sure, in, in, as you expand it. Yeah, yeah. I think you know, at, at the time it was a problem, wasn't it? More so because people were waiting for such long times without having any contact. I mean, now things are much, much better and I don't think people are waiting long for surgery. Certainly here at Salford, they seem to have caught up quite well with um, waiting lists, so they're not waiting very, very long. But still, people don't prepare themselves for surgery. So even if you've, you know, they've been living with the pain for years and years and years and, you know, haven't necessarily even gone through physiotherapy recently, um, don't know that they should be exercising and they should be getting themselves as fit as possible before an operation. Um, so just that reinforcement really and getting people to exercise will have a big effect on their um, rehab after. So, like I say, I do follow these patients up myself. Most of them, most of that 39 have had the surgery um, and I have seen them um, and the majority have done really, really well. So they haven't stayed in hospital for long. Before we did this, there were some stories about patients being in hospital for like five days after a joint replacement, which hasn't been like that for years and years and years. Rachel, did you want to come back in? Yeah, I was just going to 
pick up on the the transport point that you were discussing so transport is definitely a barrier obviously not just to this pilot but to in general services and it is something that we're looking at as a gm elective program um, one of the things we have done already is a bit of a um a recce i guess of all the different transport support services and voluntary services that can support people to get to and from appointments so we set up um, a web page with some of that information on it as it's a very much a starter and there needs to be a much wider gm conversation around you know how do we support people better to get to, to where they need to go and um, but if i put the link in the chat and if anyone's got any feedback on that let me know but it, if if you are supporting people and they're struggling there might be some useful um stuff on there yeah that would yeah would definitely have helped there's obviously yeah a large number that yeah wouldn't come because of transport issues um if there aren't any more questions do, would you like to wrap it up now louise as i know that you've got to to get yes. off um, yeah no, yeah thank you I, yeah that was um really good some really good points and i think yeah myself and sati can uh, obviously take that forward and yeah look forward to to working with you again yeah and are you happy for me to share the slides uh sure, PDF yeah, with yeah. everyone yeah absolutely uh, yeah so if you're on this I'll, I'll send you around the slides and the link to the recording and then uh you can email louise as well if you need any other questions answered no, um, sure. brilliant well thank you all for coming you get half an hour back on your lunch or whatever you're doing so enjoy and uh we'll see you soon thank you thank you thank you Thank you.